All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Justin Schmitz, representing the City of Lone Tree and Douglas County. Uh, I'm the Vice Chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee, and I call to order the June 24th, 2024 meeting at 1.30. Obviously, today we are all virtual, um, so all members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Uh, please make sure your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. Uh, we ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or to comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to the staff in the chat box and we will get those answered. As a reminder to members and alternates, uh, please press the unmute button on your computer this time, not on our fancy uh, microphones, um, and speak uh, to meet yourself. Uh, if you're not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. Also announce your name and representation whenever you're making comments for our record. Uh, finally, during the business meeting agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Uh, members of the public may speak uh, during public comment. I'm gonna go ahead and kick over to uh, Jacob real quick uh, for some comments, as well as introducing uh, our new alternates. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz. Um, so look, I just wanted to thank everyone for your flexibility. Uh, today and having this 100% virtual, as you've probably seen on the news by now, we had an incident here in downtown Denver this morning. We actually just got the all clear just a minute ago, ironically, uh, but it's been a topsy-turvy day. Uh, we're all safe and we're all fine, um, but needed uh, because of the situation to make this a virtual meeting. So thank you all um, very much for your flexibility. Um, as Vice Chair Schmitz um, indicated, we have three alternates today um, that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, Zeke Lynch is new alternate from Douglas County, so welcome to Zeke. Uh, Kyra Ruman Moore, uh, Kyra, if you're here, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, is new alternate for the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, and then finally, given that both Ron Absorf um, is out today, as well as our Executive Director Doug Rex, we have temporarily appointed Steve Cook, um, who's sitting behind me and Dr. Cox's staff, as our uh, kind of alternate voting member. Do we have any sound? And thank you, uh, Vice Chair Schmitz. Yeah, thank you, Jacob, and, and thanks to Dr. Cog's staff for thinking quickly, and, and I think that was a very good call to move this to a, a virtual meeting. Um, with it being a virtual meeting, um, Cam, if uh, you want to sort of read all of the attendance into the record, uh, we'll do that versus having everybody introduce yourself. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so in attendance right now, I see Justin Schmitz, uh, Aaron Busto, Alex Hybright, Art Griffith, Bill Zroy. Brad Rubier, Bryce Hammerton, Carson Priest, Chris Chauvin, Chris Hudson, Christina Lane, David Gaspers, David Krutzinger, Don Sluter, James Eusen, Jeff Dakenbring, Jeff Boyd, Jen Bartlett, Jessica Micklebust, Jonathan Webster, Jordan Rudel, Carrie Erickson, Kelly Van Biergen, Kent Borman, Kevin Ash, Ira Ruman, Hart, Lisa Nguyen, Allison, Michelle Melanopoulos, Mike Whitaker, Sean Ho, Walter Hort, and uh, Zeke Lynch. Those are all the people, I, uh, members and alternates I see attending at this moment. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you very much. That sounds like we definitely have a quorum, so great. Um, at this point, uh, we'll open our public comment. Um, so we will open the meeting for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, uh, and we will call on you before you speak. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You have three minutes to speak, after which time we will ask you uh, to wrap up your comments and your line will be muted. As a quick reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in discussion uh, regarding each agenda item. So with that, we are opening our public comment, and I will ask staff if uh, we have any public comment or anyone raising their hand on uh, Zoom. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second to see if anyone uh, raises their hand. 
but I do not see any, so we do not have any public comment uh, today, Mr. Vice Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we will close public comment and move into uh, the rest of our agenda. Uh, starting with, uh, at this time, um, we will go over our May 20th, 2024 tax summary. Uh, that was attachment A in your packet. Uh, if there's any discussion, corrections, or questions about the May 20th, 24 TAC meeting uh, minutes, uh, please raise your hand and uh, let us know. Give everybody another minute. All right, not seeing any, I assume that those uh, minutes are approved and uh, we can move forward into our action items. So with that, we only have one action item today. Um, this is item number four in your packet, uh, amendments to the fiscal year 2024 to 2027 transportation improvement program. It was attachment B in your packet. And Todd Cottrell, uh, Project and Program Delivery Manager, will be making the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so we have 11 amendments total for you this afternoon. Um, and I'll kind of take it in different um, sets here. We have two different tables. So this is the first set of amendments on attachment B, um, the four at the bottom of that first page. Uh, for the first amendment, we have a flex route extension from Boulder County. Uh, which provides additional transit service to Fort Collins. Um, and the scope is being requested to be amended uh, to reflect that the FY23 funds will be used uh, to purchase electric bus chargers. And so again, this is not the entire scope. This is only uh, the FY23 funds. And because uh, this is an adjustment to a local agency project, um, the Boulder County Forum, uh, um, approval was required. Um, they did approve last month in May, um, and there are two letters within your packet to, ref uh, to reflect that request from Transport in Fort Collins and the Boulder County approval. Uh, the second amendment is to CDOT Region 1 congressionally uh, directed funds. Um, this project will add three new projects for $5.3 million. Um, the third is from again from CDOT Region One for I-70 resurfacing in Jefferson County, which adds six point three million dollars of transportation commission funds. Um, and finally, for the last project in this table, we have a new project uh, from funding received in a federal CFI grant uh, for Boulder County electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, and so, as we go to the top of the next page in that second table. Um, this, there's a lot of amendments here, but they essentially are doing a couple things. Uh, so first of all, we're adding a new project and new funding for the Greenland Wildlife Overpass at I-25. Um, in addition to adding new federal funding for this project, we're also transferring project, uh, project funding from the Region 1 Design Pool, the Region 1 Safe Wildlife Crossing Pool, and the Region 1 Faster Pool. The second major action that has taken place within this table is to add a brand new project at I-25 in Colorado 7 for interim transit improvements. Um, there is no new funding being added to this project, but we are moving funds from other existing TIP projects into this brand new project, essentially trying to more clean up um, the actual TIP itself. So funding is being moved in from the Region 1 Faster Pool the Region 1 Permanent Water Quality Pool, and then the Region 1 Mobility Hub Pool. So again, those are the 11 amendments before you. I'm happy to take any questions or comments you have, uh, but there should be a uh, recommended action there on your screen or in your packet. Great, thank you for uh, that presentation, Todd. Are there any questions uh, on this topic? Looks like uh, our first question, uh, Matt Callison from City of Aurora. Thank you, Justin. Uh, good to be here all. Uh, could we have a brief description on what the new project, the I-25 uh, Route 7 interim transit improvements covers? Um, yeah, hang on. Let me pull up more information unless there's somebody else already on the call that knows more than, than I do. <clears throat> Um, uh, 
The only thing that we have in our scope is design and construct interim transit improvements at that interchange. Um, and I'd be happy. I think Jessica, I see your hand. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Hear okay. Um, excellent question. Thank you. So the I-25 C07 interim transit improvements, that is the name that is listed exactly as it is on the 10-year plan. So those funds are for the mobility hub, the like we're calling it the interim mobility hub before the full interchange someday, some year in the future may be constructed. So this is for a new multimodal hub with a bus slip ramp off of I-25 at State Highway 7, um, some parking. I believe we've had some um, conversations with the local agency as well for some fencing that they wanted that they've contributed some funding for as well as a large permanent water quality um, feature that will capture the future, if we ever do the future improvements, would be sized to capture those future um, water quality needs. Does that help, Mac? Thank you, Jessica. Yes, You're appreciate welcome. that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think up next we had uh, Kent Mormon with the question. Yeah, just the question where the Greenland uh, Greenland crossing is on I-25. Um, I'm not 100% sure, Jessica. Yeah, it's down in the gap area, um, the I-25 gap. I don't know the exact mile marker, but I can look it up pretty quick, Kent, if you'd like me to. Don't need the exact. I just was curious general location. That, that helps. Thank you. Yeah, south of Castle Rock. Well, okay. I was just driving through there this weekend, so I was curious as well. <laughs> um, looks like our next question, uh, Art Griffith from Douglas County. Art? One more time. Art, I, don't, uh, I didn't hear you, at least on my end, if you're making a comment there. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Just to answer Kent's question, I forgot to take it off mute. <laughs> um, it's about a mile and a half uh, to two miles north of the El Paso County, Douglas County boundary. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Any other questions um, on this item? what looks like no additional questions. Um, does somebody uh, like to make a motion on this? Uh, Brian Weimer, Arapo County. Yes, I'd like to move to the recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee, the attached projects that were referenced as part of Todd's uh, presentation to the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program. And it looks like Art Griffith may want to second. Yep. Art. I second that. Did that work? My speaker work? Yep, you're right on this time. All right, thanks. So we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion on this item? I'm assuming those two hands were from before, so we're going to move on. Um, so without any discussion, um, we have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor, uh, signify by unmuting yourself and saying aye. 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 I like the delayed eye. Perfect. Um, all those opposed, uh, please signify uh, by muting yourself and saying no. And are there any uh, abstentions? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a unanimous uh, motion to approve. Uh, the amendments. Thank you very much. So that was again our only official action item for the day. Um, so we are going to move now into uh, our discussion items, um, starting with uh, item number five in your packet, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program Status Report. This was attachment C for your reference. Again, uh, Todd Cottrell, Project and Program Delivery Manager, uh, is going to make the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so there's not many uh, opportunities that we get to say that we've done something completely new. Um,
But as some of you know, on this call, um, in early 2023, um, we've been reaching out to individual project sponsors to collect monthly status information on um, any project that was awarded Dr. Cog allocated funding uh, within the current TIP. Um, you know, we're collecting this information, I think, with goals to to really hone in and, re and attempt to uh, reduce project delays over time. Um, I think one thing that we certainly notice is there's sometimes not a lot of things that Dr. Cog staff can do about that. But of course, the more that we're aware and the sooner that we're aware of certain situations that may come across in your projects, and if we have the opportunity to provide assistance, we can do that in a timely manner. So again, that's sort of the first goal. But we also wanted to increase the transparency on the use of these public funds, which I think is important, not only for the general public, but also for um, our committee members and our board members, so that they know exactly what the status is of those projects um, where Dr. Cog allocated funding is going. Um, so in the attachment here is sort of our first take on the report um, that we plan on um, producing quarterly. Uh, again, we'll, we'll produce it with the latest information that we have. Um, the plan is right now is to post this information um, on the tip page of uh, the Dr. Cog website. Um, so again, this is our first attempt um, at putting this together, um, but it is planned on something right now that we'll be posting quarterly for your information. Um, so certainly if you have any questions, please let Brad and myself know. Um, but it should contain information um, at least through May, from my understanding. I don't believe it includes the July information or the June um, information that we've collected. But, but again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Todd, very much for that presentation. Yeah, it's always exciting to see new items. I agree. So, uh, And uh, I know our team gets the monthly update and tries to make sure uh, we're getting that turnaround quick. So I think it's been helpful. Appreciate it. Any questions um, for Todd? Looks like you might be good on this one. All right, thank you. Thanks, Todd, very much. So for our next item, um, which is item number six in your packet, uh, this is the Edgewater Community-Based Transportation Plan update. Uh, all the details were in attachment D uh, in your packet. And Nora Kern, our sub area and project, man project planning program manager will be making the presentation. All right, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully you guys can see that. Yep, we got it. Um, Perfect. Great. Well, thanks for let me take some time to give an update um, on the wrap up of our Edgewater School Transportation Plan. And I am going to be joined today by my colleague, Lauren Kurgis, who many of you know. Um, she was very involved in this project, so she's going to cover some of the different components she was working on as well. So just a quick background, um, kind of the reason we wanted to share this update is our Edgewater School Transportation Plan was the first of our pilot projects um, in the community-based transportation planning program. It was a pilot, so it was kind of a, an opportunity for us to learn more about um, doing these types of projects and, and how we can hopefully continue to do them and, and be successful with them in the coming years. So this project was submitted by the city of Edgewater um, about a year and a half ago. Um, we kicked off the project in March of last year of 2023. Um, and its focus was really looking at two elementary schools in the city of Edgewater, Edgewater and Lumberg Elementary School, um, to help them address some transportation safety and traffic concerns that were um, exacerbated by the recent closure of the Mulholm Elementary School, which is in that uh, shaded blue section south of the city of Edgewater. Um, so just a, a note again, the city of Edgewater was hugely helpful throughout, so really appreciative to them and their staff um, for nominating the project and working with us on it. We also did contract with a nonprofit called Edgewater Collective to support our bilingual engagement, um, and they were a huge 
huge partner on this project. And then we had Y2K Engineering on to help with the technical work. So um, this project, we are just about wrapping it up. I'm gonna cover just a few kind of snippets from the study to give kind of a flavor of what we worked on, some of our lessons learned. Um, we do, we will have the full study online here shortly. We're just wrapping up um, accessibility remediation. So if you are interested in diving more into the details, um, definitely reach out and be happy to share that with you or you can find it on the project website. Um, so we did start with existing conditions. Um, just a couple things I kind of wanted to highlight um, that kind of reinforce why we did this study. But as I mentioned, one of the, the factors we were looking at was the closure of Mulholm Elementary, which had a very big impact, particularly on Lumberg um, in the 2023 and 2024 school year. Um, kind of, again, speaking to the, the need in this community, a majority of the families at these schools speak Spanish at home. There are a number of um, socioeconomic and demographic um, challenges for these communities, particularly those south of Colfax, um, many of whom had previously been attending Mulholm and then now kind of needed to make their way north um, to Lumberg or to Edgewater. So a lot of areas that scored very high in our equity index were included as part of the study. Um, we did also look at the transportation network. So um, for those familiar with Edgewater, you know, the area right around these schools is includes a lot of kind of lower traffic, lower speed neighborhood streets. They did have very narrow sidewalks, which definitely is a, a barrier for folks walking to school. And then there's a number of very busy arterials that um, probably are not safe for elementary school students to cross. So that was another kind of factor um, going into the study. Um, Colfax in particular being directly south of the, the city of Edgewater and these two schools is a, is a major barrier along with 20th um, and, uh, and Pierce um, and 26th. So um, we did look at um, crashes. There have been a number of crashes in the vicinity of the schools. Um, a, a, quite a large number of them were pedestrian or bicyclist and a lot occurred at intersections. So those were all some considerations um, we, we took into the project. Um, and yeah, so that was just a snapshot. I did want to toss it over to my colleague, Lauren, if she wants to talk a little bit about the community engagement, which was um, our community-based transportation planning program is focused on supporting mobility for historically marginalized communities. So the engagement piece is really important. So Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Lauren Purchase, multimodal planner with Dr. Cog. Um, so as Nora mentioned, community engagement was kind of at the core of this project. Um, and we, we did engagement throughout the entirety of the project. Uh, next slide. And so for engagement, we divided it into four phases. Um, and so we started with phase one as we had a project in the spring of 2023. And this phase continued into the summer as well. And for this phase, we were looking at gathering perspectives on current conditions, needs, and experiences from students, from school families, and from community members to see um, what things looked like currently for them, what were their experiences um, getting to and from school. And then for phase two, this was in the fall of 2023. And so for this phase, we were looking at parent perspectives on um, needs for the for the current school year, for the new school year. So as Nora mentioned, enrollment increased um, pretty significantly at Lumberg and at Edgewater Elementary as well in the new school year. And so we wanted to hear from parents to see what did things look like in the new school year with the increase in enrollment. Phase three was in the winter of this year. And for this phase, we had drafted our recommendations and shared those out um, to get some feedback on those. And we also wanted to evaluate perceptions around a pop-up demonstration project. And then phase four, our final phase was this spring. For this phase, we conducted the pop-up demonstration project. We gathered input on the pop-up and we shared out the final plan. Next slide. And so with engagement, we wanted to try some different innovative strategies. Um, this was our pilot project for the community-based transportation planning program. Um, 
And so it's been a great learning process. These are some of the things that we wanted to highlight as um, innovative strategies that we tried out. Um, so as Nora mentioned, we worked really closely with a community-based organization called Edgewater Collective. They are uh, very tapped into the community in Edgewater. They have connections with the city, with, with the schools. So they were really great in supporting engagement and getting us tapped into existing events. Um, so we attended different community events, such as city festivals, school festivals, um, to be there, to hand out flyers, to talk with folks um, about the project and to get their feedback. We also had a uh, social pinpoint website. So this is where we hosted engagement online. And this website was both informative and interactive. So people could go there to learn more about the project, to sign up for updates. Um, and then they could also interact and give their feedback. They could um, view recommendations on a map, drop pins on the map and so on. And for all of our engagement um, in person and online, it was all bilingual. Um, I think upwards of like 70% of the families at these schools are Spanish speaking. We also conducted some walk audits. And so we had a couple in the spring of 2023 that were kind of more traditional walk audits with um, mem uh, city officials, with uh, school principals, community members. And then we also had a walk audit in the summer of 23 with students. Um, so that was really fun to hear from them um, to see kind of what they would like to see around their school for improvements. We also had a couple of focus groups. And for those focus groups, we did offer compensation. Um, it was $25 for the hour for their time. And then we offered child care and food for the focus groups as well. And we held those focus groups right after the end of the school day so that families wouldn't have to make a special trip back to the school at a different time for the focus groups. Um, they'd already be there to pick up their kids. And then lastly, uh, three we held three transportation planning sessions. This was part of Jefferson Success Academy which is a summer program through Edgewater Collective and the schools. Um, and that was what the walk audit with the students, um, we, did, we did that with the, with the students. Um, and then we also had two additional planning sessions with them um, that were sort of more traditional like classroom um, activities, talking about what is transportation planning, um, and additionally, having them kind of draw like what their ideal street would look like. So that was really fun to hear from students. Next slide. And so as we've wrapped up this project, we've looked at evaluating the engagement process. These are some of the metrics that we have. Um, we had over 800 website views from over 450 website visitors. As far as we know, we've been mentioned in two news outlets, um, and then we had nearly 200 total survey responses, and 50% of those that completed a survey chose to do so um, in Spanish. So overall, um, we think it went pretty well. Edgewater is a small community, so having over 800 website views um, kind of stands out to us um, as a win for engagement and reaching folks. Um, but definitely lots to learn as part of the process. And I think Nora is going to touch more on some of our lessons learned later on. Yeah, great, Lauren. Um, so, you know, thanks in part due to the, the extensive um, engagement process. Um, we worked with Y2K in the city to come up with a number of recommendations. Um, kind of broad categories of the recommendations are, you know, engineering, um, which included, you know, parking, operations, loading zones, the curbs around the schools. Um, we also had a number of recommendations related to en engagement, encouragement, and then um, education as well, particularly related to the families at the schools, as well as the staff and the crossing guards, making sure they had the, the proper education they needed. Um, I will kind of briefly show you some of the, the recommendations. I, I Like I said at the, the start, won't go into all the details. Happy to provide more if you're curious. But um, this is the recommendations for the city or for the um, Edgewater Elementary School. Um, there were a number that kind of were related to parking and loading. Um, we also recommended a um, the exploration of a four-way stop at 24th and Depew. 
Um, and then the rest of the recommendations were, were really focused on the parking lot um, where a lot of the students pick up and drop off and making sure there was kind of clear um, markings in there so students who are either walking or picking up and dropping off could do so safely. And then some um, clearer marking, markings on, along the curbs on Depew. Um, we had significantly more recommendations at um, Lumberg Elementary School, which you're seeing here. Um, just a couple kind of highlights of these. Um, a lot of them were about kind of organizing the school pickup and drop off flow, um, both to kind of mitigate some of the traffic concerns, but also to make it safer for everybody. It was it was very chaotic in the morning around the school. So chaotic for, for families driving, but also chaotic for the pretty good portion of students that do walk. Um, so just for example, there was a, a one of the main recommendations, which we actually explored through a pop up was to make West 22nd a one way. We recommended a number of changes to operations, kind of um, using a more of a hug and go model um, and encouraging students to walk and to ride the bus, which wasn't um, really being utilized to the, the most extent. Um, and then a lot of the recommendations were to kind of look at having more off-site or remote loading and parking areas to kind of encourage parents to drop off in a variety of different locations um, and walk with their students to school as opposed to all trying to be in the same spot at the same time, um, particularly with the growth of the enrollment um, with mobile home students. There was um, a lot of issues around West 22nd um, as more and more parents just tried to drive down that street in a short window of time. Um, and then last, there is, if you're familiar with Pierce Street, there is currently a raised crosswalk and a rapid flashing beacon, but the volume of students is so high that are using it. We um, did recommend upgrading that to a um, pedestrian hybrid beacon um, as funding allows. So just kind of a flavor. Um, we also had some recommendations to crosswalks, um, signage, just to make sure um, it was as safe and clear as possible for everyone kind of moving around the schools um, during and, and after school. So did want to just mention quickly the pilot project. So Lauren, if you want to kind of talk, talk to that just real quickly. Yeah, so um, we did a pilot or a pop-up project in front of Blumberg Elementary. Um, next slide. And it started in April of this year. That's when everything was installed and the changes were made. And it's currently ongoing. And so the goal for the pop-up was to look at improving safety, traffic flow, and efficiency in the parent pickup and drop-off process in front of Lumberg. Next slide. And so a few changes for the pop-up. Um, the big change is that uh, West 22nd, which is the street here in the picture directly in front of Lumberg Elementary, was converted to be one way um, in between Newland Street and Pierce Street. It's a pretty small section of the street that's one way. Um, it's the section that basically covers West 22nd directly in front of the school. Um, and then with that change. Um, the school also instituted a new hug and go drop off pickup operation for those families that are dropping off their kids by car. Um, and so with that change, the idea uh, is to, to have it be one way so folks are driving in their vehicle can turn right into the circular parking lot and then pull up, drop their students off, and then come out of the lot at the other side and take a right and continue along their way. Um, and in addition to um, converting to one way and trying the new hug and go, um, there was also a relocation of the crossing guard. It was um, previously directly uh, in front of the school where the cars are leaving that parking lot. And so in order to minimize conflicts, with vehicles and pedestrians, the crossing guards um, were moved to the intersection of Pierce and West 22nd. And then another crossing guard is um, further down the street at the intersection with Otis. Next slide. And then additionally, um, this here is the intersection of West 22nd and Pierce. Um, before the pop-up project, the left turn from 22nd onto Pierce was prohibited, but with the pop-up, now that um, left turn is physically blocked. Next slide. And so we've gotten a 
a fair amount of feedback on the pop-up. Generally, it's been positive. Folks have said that um, speeds are slower. Um, it feels safer and more pleasant for those that are walking and biking. Um, there have been some concerns, mostly from residents on Otis Street. So Otis Street is the street in between Newland and Pierce um, and intersects with West 22nd right at the entrance of the school or the front of the school. Um, and so those residents on Otis uh, said that they were seeing a lot more traffic on their street. They're finding it inconvenient for when they wanted to travel south. Um, and then they also um, noted that some school families were using the alley um, to, to turn left basically because they could no longer turn left at the intersection um, with Pierce. Um, but as far as we know, the, the city wants to trial it for the summer as well to kind of see what traffic flow looks like during the summer. Um, but they're aware of the feedback and they're currently working on some different options to try to address those concerns from the residents on Otis Street. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. So just to wrap up here, um, you know, this was our pilot project. So we did want to kind of um, also think about how some of the lessons learned from this project could be applied to future community-based transportation planning projects. So a number of these we've already touched on, but I think one of our biggest takeaways was just the value of having a community-based organization involved um, and the need to kind of continue to explore different creative um, ways to engage the community, particularly communities that either are low income or Spanish speaking or maybe haven't been as involved in transportation planning historically. Um, the pop-up was a huge success, um, especially since it really allowed the city of Edgewater to try out some of the recommendations, learn what was working, what was not before kind of making things permanent. Um, and then internally, I think we've we've been learning how to kind of do these projects as a as a regional agency, kind of the how to um, the need to make sure we're really clear on roles between us and the consultants and the city and, and nonprofits we're working with. Um, and then last, and I'm sure this is not a surprise to anyone, but just particularly with these kind of smaller projects and projects in um, kind of historically marginalized communities, the need to stay flexible. Um, we were able to kind of pivot um, as things came up and as we heard about different opportunities. So that was definitely a big part of the success of this project. Um, looking ahead, um, just we have one other pilot community-based transportation planning project, which is underway. That's our North Federal Community Transportation Plan. Um, it's looking at this here area on the map and really looking at um, potential microtransit options in this area. So we're working closely with Adams County, the city of Westminster, and then a nonprofit called Growing Home on this project. Um, and then um, you may recall, we have five projects that were approved um, through the community-based transportation planning set aside. So those will be rolling out in the coming months, starting with the 303 Artway and Montbello Loop implementation plan and the Brighton Core City study. Um, and then, yeah, we will be kind of our next call for projects for this program is going to be kind of late summer or fall of 2025. So if this kind of jogged any ideas in, in your area that you might be interested in submitting, um, we definitely would encourage you to submit kind of next year when the when the um, let call for letter call for letters of nomination reopens. So with that, yep, happy to take any questions, but thanks for um, yeah, letting us share a little bit about this project. Yeah, thank you, Nora and Lauren. That was a very informative presentation. It looks like we have a question from uh, Sean Poe from Commerce City. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, had a question on the schedules of the new projects. Mm -hmm. um, are those just determined based on capacity? Because uh, I know there's some are uh, a little sooner than the other the other ones. With Commerce City being the, the last one, just trying to understand how the schedule was determined on that procurement. Yep, it was. Um, yeah, pretty much, Sean. That's a good question. It was largely a question of capacity for our team and for the consultant team. We're trying to not have too many requests for proposals on top of each other. I know, you know, relatively a small world of folk transportation consultants in, in Denver. So um, we did we did talk with all the different, um, the five projects that were not nominated to try to figure out kind of a logical cadence. Um, so we're, we're definitely hoping to get to all of them with, within a year or so. So we're hoping to start, um, for example, I think the Commerce City one is scheduled last, but hoping to start it early next year, so. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Brian? 
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. A couple of questions. Well, I guess one question and uh, maybe some history. So with Lumberg, um, I see there's a lot of residential streets around it. And so was there a lot of parking drop offs on those residential streets that created issues? And if so, uh, how did you address those in terms of you know, circulation patterns, are those being addressed or what's the long-term solution to solving that issue? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, Lumberg is in a residential area, not unlike a lot of kind of our older elementary schools, and middle schools in the region. Um, so before a lot of the problems were, it just wasn't very organized. Parents weren't really receiving any instructions on where to go. So it was kind of a free for all. Um, so kind of our recommendation is to kind of, um, have a more organized traffic pattern. So that is kind of why the street was made one way to kind of encourage parents who are going in that direction or on, on West 22nd, which is, is a very narrow street. There's not really room on the street for two-way traffic and parking on each side. So trying to kind of organize the people who are driving, um, encourage people to walk, bike, or take the bus. So there was a, there is, there are some buses that are kind of underutilized, and then we are actually encouraging people to consider dropping off elsewhere, um, not on West 22nd. This is a strategy we've seen really successful, for example, at Edgewater Elementary School, where um, some of the, you know, depending on your grade, kids are picked up um, from different locations around the school. And again, that's just because West 22nd is, is a narrow residential street. So trying to avoid concentrating the vehicles there and trying to give some parents some different options, that's a little bit less chaotic. So that was kind of the strategy overall. Okay. Is the school committed then to updating the parents annually as to what the circulation pattern is to be and how to do it? Yeah, we hope so. So Lumberg now has a new principal. And so that's just, you know, a challenge. Um, but we're, we have kind of put together a playbook for the new principal that's incoming. And the city of Edgewater has also been working with them and, and um, Jefferson County School District to kind of make sure that those those uh, new recommendations can kind of be implemented in the coming year. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other questions? I did have one myself, Nora, as well. Just uh, you talked about roles, responsibilities. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense in these projects. But one question was, um, oops, got kicked off. So one question was, who actually put in the pilot project? Was that the city? Did you guys contract it? How did that contractor actually get brought on to do that work? Oh, sorry, I missed the first part of that. My screen screen froze. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it jumped out. That I think I was just asking, you know, who actually helped implement the the pilot project in the street there? Oh, um, yes. Um, yes, so we um, are our planning consultant, Y2K Engineering, they were responsible for kind of doing the designs and kind of recommending, you know, signage and those sorts of things, but it was actually implemented just by city staff at the city of Edgewater. They had the, I think all the materials pretty much on hand and were able to put up the signage and the barricades and even redo some of the striping just over the, I think, over a couple of days. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have a comment from uh, Jacob or Cam. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz. Um, just wanted to recognize Nora and Lauren and the other Dr. Cox staff who work on this project. As Nora said, it was a pilot project. We've never done something like this before. A uh, really unique and innovative project. Um, I think it set a really high standard for our future community-based transportation plans, uh, which again, Nora said, we'll be doing five uh, from this recent first call from the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, and we'll have at least one more call coming in the next year or two um, to do more projects. So hope this sparks some interest, but we're really excited about this program. Um, and again, want to thank Nora and her team and Lauren uh, for the work that they've done for setting such a high standard for doing this kind of work. Thank you. Great, thank you, very good. One last call, any last questions before we move on? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Nora and Lauren. Uh, we're going to move on to item number seven. Uh, that is the Regional Bicycle and Pedestrian Counts Program. This was attachment E 
in your packet. I'm going to do my best with the last name here, Aaron, but uh, Aaron Villery with uh, the Senior Active uh, Transportation Planner with Dr. Cog for the presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and yes, perfect pronunciation. I appreciate it. Um, screen. All right. Uh, yeah, so thank you for, for having me today. Uh, my name is Darren Villaria, um, and I am the Senior Action Transportation Planner. Um, and just wanted to give uh, folks a little update on some uh, some new developments in the Bicycle and Pedestrian Counts program uh, for the region that, that Dr. Cog administers um, and make you aware of some, some new resources and um, some things that we'd like to solicit feedback on as, as we look to expand the program a little bit. So um, with that... So uh, where this draws from, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Uh, in the in the the current active transportation plan, one of the recommendations for Dr. Cog and for the region was to uh, enhance or to collect bicycle and pedestrian counts across the region and enhance uh, count data sharing. So that's really the sort of plan basis for uh, our bicycle and pedestrian count program. Um, and just to talk about a little bit of what's happened in the last five years since that plan was adopted. Um, the uh, in that time, Dr. Cog has created and uh, maintained a regional bicycle and pedestrian counts dashboard that lives on our data portal online, and and so we uh, we collect a, a warehouse of counts from across the region um, uh, in in a variety of locations, variety of different count types, and that's available for for download for access for uh, members of the public and for Dr. Cog members, of course. Uh, so what's in that? Uh, well, we've we've taken sort of a, a concerted effort each year. Uh, to conduct an annual, as part of our annual data request, we request uh, active user counts uh, from our member jurisdictions. And so what we get from that is, is a mix of both short duration counts that are maybe a couple hours at a time, um, as well as some permanent count locations that we're able to, to put together a, a sample to, to get some average volume to different locations. Um, so we get those annually collected from members that you all are, are collecting and, and generating uh, Dr. Cog has also historically led some manual accounts. These specifically are generally happening on TIP project locations or in quarters where uh, TIP projects have, have occurred or are about to occur, um, as well as our, our transportation operations program uh, uh, collects counts um, across the region coinciding with their uh, signal coordination uh, projects and efforts. And so all these different um, uh, sort of conduits bring bring together count information, and, and that's all stored online. But uh, it's it's a really good basis to start. But uh, what we've been uh, interested in doing, um, and just to give you a little bit more uh, peek under the hood on, on what's in there, um, what we have as far as sample size, we have about uh, on average about sixty permanent count sites are submitted per year, and so a lot of these counts have, you know, um, sort of a varying number of unique sites that we're getting continuous counts throughout the year that we can have a really good image of, of what's happening at, at certain locations. And the number of manual count sites we found have really varied that, that in some years, uh, especially when there are focused initiatives happening around data collection, you can get a, a really large number of manual counts. And then in, in many years, there uh, really aren't that many. So anywhere between zero and 50, you know, and, and so these are these together sort of bring a, a complete image of, of active user activity in the region and, and trends. Um, so we wanted to set that baseline of, of what we're really looking to do. Uh, we have some goals around our account program and, and really why we want to expand in it, invest some uh, time and resources into it. Uh, we wanna be able to, so these are some program goals that we have for our accounts program. We wanna be able to benchmark significant corridors, especially things that uh, we've noted uh, in, in planning documents, such as the extra transportation corridors. We wanna be able to track bench, uh, trends over time. Um, we want to benchmark ridership and activity. Uh, we want to track annual tra activity trends so that when, uh, when folks ask us are, are more or fewer people biking and walking, we we have a, um, some information that we feel uh, really confident in uh, to understand what's happening across the region. Uh, we also want to be able to uh, um, assess TIP funded projects before and after. We want to do uh, assist with good storytelling around those projects to really understand the impact. Um, of those investments. Um, we want to be able to maintain seasonal factors data. And so this is one of those places where it's uh, uh, really important to have uh, different snapshots at different times of the year, um, sort of across the region and consistent locations so we sort of understand, you know, um, uh, how does activity change in the fall versus the spring versus the summer? Um, 
how do day, you know, time of day travel trends uh, vary uh, um, uh, over time. So we want to be able to maintain those, those factors that we've developed historically. Um, we want to be able to study specific sites or answer research questions on an ad hoc basis. And then ultimately, the, the thing that we'd like to do is, is uh, have a, um, an estimate of regional uh, region-wide network volumes, especially for people bicycling, but also uh, as much as we can, people walking in, bicycling, and using active transportation to really understand how much travel, how many trips, what kinds of trips um, are happening. And so those are the things that we're really keeping in mind uh, as, as we invest our time in this uh, in this program. Uh, and so uh, what the um, Active and Emerging Mobility Team has been doing over the uh, past year or so is um, engaging um, uh, when, you know, sort of as opportunities arise uh, with peer MPOs and agencies um, and sort of understanding some of the best practices around count programs. Uh, here's just sort of an example of things that we've learned. Um, a number of MPOs have lending library models of, of mobile counters um, that really help expand the flexibility and agility um, of their member governments to collect information. Um, and we've also just found that um, there's a lot of variability in different regions and different jurisdictions about the formality of agreements with local jurisdictions and how those counts are collected, that there's there's really not a, um, a lot of consistency across the, the US uh, in, in how counts are collected. Um, but to that end, sort of when we were looking at the number of permanent locations and and how those investments have gone and, and sort of what we want to be able to do uh, with our accounts program. Uh, a strategic, strategic decision that Dr. Cog made was uh, we recently procured some mobile count equipment. And so uh, we went through a vendor named EcoCounter and we pr uh, procured six mobile multi-counters, which is uh, a paired infrared and uh, tube-based system uh, that can be deployed um, in a variety of environments uh, to collect uh, accurate count data for people bicycling and walking. Um, and so what we really like about this system is, is we'd like to augment existing capacity that member jurisdictions have, that our partners uh, have. Uh, we'd like to be able to count in a variety of contexts. Um, and so these are really flexible uh, uh, equipment option um, that we can use uh, primarily in either low speed, um, low volume contexts. Uh, so not major arterial roadways, but um, you know, local streets where there's mixed operation or in paths and trails um, and separated bike lanes where um, uh, these are these are sort of meant for a, a less intense uh, user context, but can be deployed in a lot of different ways uh, that we really like. They also have a really user friendly uh, web dashboard and data access so that um, it gives us a lot of flexibility in how counters are put into the field and how we collect data um, and digest it and bring it back. And so um, what we've been developing and sort of the thing that we're soliciting feedback on uh, today and, and just wanted to um, gather some input on um, is coming up with uh, deployment criteria for this equipment. Um, so uh, some things that we've cited as, as higher priorities, um, we want to be able to, to assist with evaluating TIP funded projects both before and after implementation and have a good reliable method of, of collecting count data um, uh, in in a variety of locations uh, that doesn't necessarily require someone to go out with a clipboard um, and and to help with that storytelling. Um, and then I'm going to talk about these in more detail, but we also want to assist with the actual transportation plan, both its uh, development and implementation. We want to be able to track multi-year user trends um, in a variety of contexts. We want to be able to ground truth data, um, support regional count estimation, and then uh, track special events and uh, sort of ad hoc deployment context. So um, I uh, just wanted to talk a little, a little bit about this. Um, something that's come up and been identified as a need is the difficulty um, both of collecting after data, before and after data um, on TIP funded projects. And so uh, having an ability to um, deploy equipment for uh, a short period of time, a designated window of time um, to assist with that storytelling and also assist in um, future uh, rounds uh, of the program um, with with understanding the impacts of different types of projects. Um, so having having more data around uh, the tip, um, 
Support looking at trends or supporting uh, implementation of the active transportation program. So specifically looking at places that we've identified in the regional active transportation network. We're currently updating the, the extra transportation plan. Uh, we, we just kicked that off. And so um, as we're either developing that or in future years, as we're understanding the impacts of some of these recommendations, uh, having the ability to um, gather a lot of information with a lot of agility uh, is uh, something that we're um, uh, considering as important criteria when we decide how to deploy these counters. Um, and then one of the other opportunities that's really come up is, is that we are uh, getting access to um, sources of big data. So for instance, um, the Enric Ride Report uh, shared micromobility dashboard collects a lot of information around shared micromobility trips, and Dr. Cog manages this uh, this dashboard um, that tracks all of the shared bike, e-bike, and uh, e-scooter trips around the region. And so, um, we're you know we have access to things like Strava Metro View, and and so using those big data sources and having ground truth uh, collected data. Uh, um, to really sort of leverage that into understanding uh, region-wide activity um, is, is a really important criteria for uh, considering uh, where to uh, deploy these counters, where to use uh, scarce resources. Um, and then and finally, uh, um, uh, tracking things like special events, bike to work day coming up is something that we, we'd like to be able to, to sort of count in future years and look at the impact. And then upon request from member governments, um, as, as you all have, have projects on a more ad hoc basis, we're sort of considering criteria um, for how do we make these available to members and, and uh, assess uh, different uh, proposed deployments and, and things like that. And so those are the, the things we're considering. And so the question that we wanted to put forward uh, to you all is um, um, if, if there are any specific use cases or any practices around uh, having access to account equipment um, that you wanted to um, make sure that we were aware of, we're, we're sort of thinking about how to strategically best uh, make use of, of uh, this new equipment and uh, new opportunities to um, better understand activity in the region and improve our data collection. Um, and so that was the update that I wanted to give. I wanted to put my contact information up, but um, wanted to make people aware that that we have this new capacity and, and capability and, and we're gonna be testing out over the next few months, um, sort of best practices around how to uh, deploy equipment and, and keep uh, collecting better data. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn the floor back over to the chair and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, uh, great update. and. Open it up to any questions. I know Aaron asked specifically if anybody has some maybe test cases or if you want to be first in line uh, to get uh, access to them, you may want to make a comment. But uh, any comments or, or questions for Aaron? Uh, Matt Collison, City of Aurora. Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Aaron. Um, was curious, uh, or will you be developing uh, best practices, uh, methodologies on sampling, uh, day of week, week of month, month of year, that type of thing um, to help us, uh, you know, develop. You, you mentioned having a having a consistent uh, uh, database to the extent possible, of course, um, uh, across the region for, for comparative purposes uh, on that. We'd be very interested in, in what your thoughts and, and research are bringing. Um, in in regards to that, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, we absolutely are. You know, I'm I'm in the process of developing materials that's just sort of basic program management around this, and and with that, you know, um, we've gotten some guidance from uh, from our vendor Eco Counter um, just about the um, uh, the equipment itself. But then also there's there's a, a decent amount of, of national research on this, and we've worked with some national researchers in the past around best practices for deployment period, you know, time of week. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to be sort of using like what's in that national best practice and also just kind of what works within our context, how much demand there is, I think, for different counters and things like that to try to strike that balance of, you know, what's a good amount of time to have it out um, in the field at each location, um, 
Uh, I think part of what we're developing right now is is the sort of like what are the criteria? How do we assess like a um, an important deployment context and um, yeah, some some basic practices that are sort of user friendly around how do you fit it into an operation schedule, things like that. So um, we're very much like in the phase of of kind of testing and piloting. You know, how does this work? And and I want to get a better understanding of the demand among uh, different jurisdictions. Um, to either collect data or to, um, uh, uh, you know, have assistance in uh, in deploying counters. So, um, thank you for that. De we're we're definitely interested, as I suspect many communities will be. Um, a follow up from that: uh, any any ability to um, uh, to separate uh, kinetic or acoustic bikes, if you will, from e bikes? Out of curiosity. Yeah. Um, that is a good question. And I don't believe with this equipment there is, there's, there's some ability to differentiate, um, sort of types of vehicles based on some pretty crude metrics like wheelbase and things like that. But, um, um, at this point, like the things that we'll be able to tell very reliably is, is it like a wheeled bicycle versus a pedestrian? That's sort of the best we have. And, and beyond that, you know, you sort of get into, um, needing more expensive data collection, <laughs> um, such as video and things like that. So unfortunately not, but it's also, you know, we sort of see it as one piece in the puzzle. So it might be the kind of thing that we can augment with some, you know, manual counts and going out and doing the good old fashioned clipboard collection. So okay. I think Thank we sort you. of see it as a piece in the puzzle. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Great. I think Brian Weimer, I see his hand as well. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the presentation. My question is, will you have the ability to um, determine what is a work trip versus a recreational trip? Mm. Um, that is a great question. Not from this, not specifically from this count equipment. Um, I think that's one of the uh, things that we're um, sort of hoping to use it for in the, I would say in the medium term um is to assist with with cal recalibrating or, or updating dr cox travel model um which does sort of get into that you know um uh having the you know a synthetic uh model population that starts to differentiate work versus uh recreational versus you know other other purpose driven trip um but uh part of it is is just using different data sources i think one of the things we're really interested in is data fusion um, so using these big data sources that we have, you know, some access to like Strava, for instance, is a data source that, you know, by itself is not a great indicator of, of use, but can be a good indicator of things like share of recreational versus commute trips. And, and so sort of using all these different things like our travel model, like some different purchased, uh, big data sources, um, um, and then having things like Strava that we can sort of put them all together. And we've been talk talking to some of our peers like in, in Portland at the MPO um, or at Oregon Metro um, um, and uh, some other places to try to uh, get at some of that information. So um, we sort of see this as an important collection source to, to have so that we can start to get into those that next level of questions, if that, um, if that makes sense. Great. Thanks, Aaron. It looks like uh, another question from uh, Kelly. Thank you. I had one quick com comment. Um, I've worked with these in the past with the mobile. Um, maybe work with your internal parks department um, to have the area mowed beforehand. Um, we lost some pneumatic tubes in the past. Um, my question is more on the data sharing side of things. Um, so you'll have access to the EcoVizio dashboard. Um, but what does that look like for the member communities that would be participating? Would there be some sort of report or access to the dashboard? Or how do you kind of envision um, sharing that um, data collected out? Absolutely. Um, great, great question and, and great feedback, certainly on, on we would like to be very coordinated with local operation schedule <laughs> to sort of minimize our, our equipment loss. Um, um, I imagine it's a less and that that you only have to to learn once maybe <laughs> yeah, I, I hope um uh as for sharing data um 
Absolutely. And, and and I think a little bit of this will be trial and error, but one of the nice things that we really like about the EcoVisio dashboard is the um the sort of ease of access. And so the I think the idea is is we want to make this readily available. Um so um whatever the easiest way to do that, that is, whether you know, if, if we work with um a jurisdiction um on a short-term deployment and Dr. Cog just downloads and shares that data back with you at the end of it. Um then you know we're we're sort of enacting the process right now of like what agreements do we need to have in place that sort of stipulate the responsibilities to uh to share that data back but the the goal is certainly to um to make it available and make it useful um uh to our member jurisdictions and to have some um good reciprocity so um yeah yeah we'll 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 be learning in the coming months but um certainly want to make it available as Thank easily you. as possible. Yeah, I think we've all lost a counter or two to Street Sweeper. So yeah, always something to coordinate there. Um, any other questions on this item? I'm not seeing any. I want to thank Aaron for his time and his presentation. That was very uh, informative. Uh, up next, uh, that was the end of our discussion items uh, for today. Uh, moving on to our, our informational items. Uh, this is item number eight in your packet. And this is the fiscal year 2024 strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation discretionary grant, SMART for short, um, information forms. It was attachment F in the packet. Um, and Jacob uh, Rigger is going to uh, make this quick presentation in the Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz, and thank you for, for spelling it out so I can just use the acronym. Um, this is the next round of Stage 1 SMART Grants. Um, in fact, this is the third, I believe, third and final round of Stage 1 SMART Grants. So um, this just continues our practice that whenever there is a notice of funding opportunity or NOFO um, for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Discretionary Grants, uh, we do send out these informational forms. We do ask folks um, who are potentially interested in um, submitting a grant um, to be a project sponsor to fill out these forms just again for communal awareness that we can share this with all of you um, and that we're all aware of what our uh, what our neighbors and, and jurisdictions are going to be thinking about in terms of projects. Um, so for this round of stage one smart grant funding, uh, we received two applications, one from the city of Commerce City and then one actually ourselves that we submitted because we're interested um, in potentially submitting another uh, stage one application. So um, that's all I have to say on that, Vice Chair Schmitz. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments on the, uh, that item on the smart brain? All right. Well, seeing none, we will move on to our administrative items. Uh, looks like a short list today, but uh, any member comments, other matters uh, that we did not address uh, on our agenda? Okay, seeing, seeing none, our next meeting uh, will be July 22nd, 2024. And it uh, looks like we have a hand up there back at the uh, Dr. Cog office. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz. Uh, just again, want to thank everyone for their flexibility today in converting this to a virtual meeting. And just to remind folks, as Aaron Villery said earlier, Bike to Work Day is this Wednesday. Um, so hope to see you all out there. Thank you. Yes, that's, thanks for that reminder. Uh, it's going to be a nice, warm bike to work day, so we can all get out there and uh, enjoy the ride in, and then you know, uh, sweat on the way home. So it'll be a, a good day out there. Um, again, our next meeting will be July twenty second, twenty twenty four, uh, back uh, in person at Dr. Cog's office. Um, and with that, uh, we are now adjourned at two thirty nine. Thank you all. <laughs>